Hello, thank you for being here and welcome to the 2.30 panel on cultivation myths. Please silence your cell phones. We've been having a heck of a lot of problem with that today. I am Shango Lose, host of the Shaping Fire podcast. If you like listening to smart interviews with the top minds in cannabis, I invite you to check out the show at shapingfire.com. We also have an extraordinary YouTube channel with over 150 speaker videos I've recorded at events just like this one. In fact, all three of our panelists today appear on the Shaping Fire YouTube channel. Uh, so, our speakers on our panel today are Colin Bell, to immediately to my right and to him, um, is co-founder of is co-founder and chief growth officer of Grosentia Mammoth Microbes. He received his PhD in biological sciences, specializing in soil microbial ecology and plant microbe interactions. Next to Colin is Peter Conjoyan. Uh, Peter created his research and consulting business, Conjoyant Horticulture Education Services Incorporated in 1992 and has been immersed in both the commercial and research areas of the U.S. greenhouse industry for several decades. His current research is focused on controlled environment agriculture and hydroponic crop production. Uh, to his farthest side is, uh, is our good friend Jeff. Jeff Lowenfels, author of the seminal Teeming with Microbes, Teeming with Nutrients, and Teeming with Fungi book series on the Soil Food Web. Jeff, when I asked him for his bio for today, even though I've said it many times, I said, do you have any upgrades? He goes, no, just skip my bio and say, oh, where'd it go? Don't ruin your joke, Shango. That Jeff might be Lord of the Roots and write books, but he is most proud of starting Plant a Row for the Hungry a program designed to get every gardener in the United States to grow one row of food to donate to someone who needs it. You don't need to buy his books, but you do need to plan a row. So we appreciate that too. <laughs> so our panel today uh, is a little different. It's actually pretty exciting. It is entitled Dispelling Myth in Commercial Cannabis Cultivation. And when I was talking with the guys in advance of the panel, I was like, so like, what do we want to talk about that hasn't been done again and again and again at cultivation? And they all started talking about the things that people do that bug them. And I'm like, all right, I got, a, I got a list of all these things that the guys hate. And I'm like, all right, that'll be the theme. Let's call it Dispelling Myths, and here we are. So all new content from the fellas. So um, question one, <clears throat> let's get warmed up with something really open-ended. So we're going to start with Colin, and then Jeff, and then Peter on, in, on this question, um, so everyone can jump in. So Colin, um, one thing we have all seen is how much in cannabis uh, we all need to unlearn. Uh, myths are everywhere, from people who think you can identify the sex of a seed by looking at it, to others thinking that you can get higher if you hold your hit long enough to cough. And both are <laughs> obviously untrue. Cultivation has its own wide range of myths. So Colin and then uh, Jeff and Peter, what is a cultivation myth that you still see people talking about that needs to be identified and fixed within cannabis horticulture practices? So I think I'll start with uh, simple microbiology, and this is going to be a little academic and a little geeky, but the idea that you don't need microbes or microbes aren't important in agriculture systems and that you can actually sterilize systems, any kind of organic or root systems, it's actually not true. There's no such thing as a sterile system anywhere. You can't really fully sterilize anything, not food, not water nothing and so the idea of thinking that you can work with a sterile system is completely biologically impossible and so I would like to start with that right on so what do you what do you think the ramifications are of that I think the ramifications of thinking you're dealing with a sterile system are one you're attempting to sterilize a system that's not possible so you're putting a lot of effort and buying a lot of disinfectant chemicals that you're flushing through your root environment. And so you're spending time and money doing something that's not going to be fruitful. And the second part of that, and I think more importantly, you will knock off a lot of microbes when you flush disinfectants through a root zone of a plant, and most of these are gonna be beneficials. And so what I think is a real challenge with that paradigm is you're going to kill off a lot of beneficial microbes that you really want to have within your rhizosphere, within your grow zone, and you're going to promote potentially the, the uh, competitive advantage of pathogens that can exist in that environment. And, and what I would say is if we can bridge the gap 
of understanding how to bring natural processes into these precision hydroponic agriculture environments and fight biology against biology, you can actually learn to nurture beneficial microbes to balance out the, the potential pests that will inhabit your root zone without them being there. That's great. Can I do a Bernie Sanders? <laughs> well, actually, you're up next okay. anyway. Same question. <laughs> I, oh, same question. Well, I, I have a different answer, but I just want to add on to that. I mean, from my perspective, and it's not a perfect analogy, is the, the, if you read my second book, things don't go into a cell unless they have an electrical charge on them, with the exception of boron. If you, It's the microbes that put the charge on. That's sort of how I put it. And if you don't have the microbes, you don't have the charge. And if you don't have the charge, you're not getting anything in your cells that you want to get in there. So that's why we do it that way. But All right, so what bugs me more than anything? Yeah, cultivation risk. You know, when we first had this discussion, I was going to say flushing. Uh, but but yeah. since then, I've been, yeah. I've been working and uh, thinking. And uh, I'm going to say worse than that, removing leaves, live leaves from a plant you know, ostensibly in order to get more light on the bud so that it'll fatten up and grow bigger. I hate that. <laughs> I, I cannot, for the love of me, see why anybody would in the life of me want to do that. Why would they want to take a photosynthesizing factory and shut it down, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, that just doesn't make any sense at all. If you happen to believe that the sun is what causes that bud to swell by falling directly on the bud itself, even though it has a limited amount of photosynthetic leaves in it. Uh, you know, you can, you can take the leaf and just sort of bend it out of the way or clip it out of the way or tape it out of the way. Don't cut live leaves from a plant, period. Right on. <laughs> Peter, same question to you. Um, uh, what's a cultivation myth that you want to expose some light on? Well, I want to first uh, build on what Colin referenced about the natural biome around the plant. For the past 15 years as a traditional commercial greenhouse researcher, I've been working with water treatment, the chemicals that Colin mentioned we have to be careful with. My work has been treating systems and irrigation lines so that we can reduce algae biofilm and plant pathogen populations. If I could draw an analogy between East and Western medicine and how over our lifetime we seem to be meeting somewhere in the middle, we now need to find that sweet spot where we can control the algae and the biofilm throughout the system but not be injecting enough to harm the natural balance of the microbes. So, so for me it's all about research, research, learning, gaining knowledge, and Colin and I are talking about how we might collaborate and bring the two worlds together. My pet peeve, or the myth that I'd like to dispel, is whenever I'm in a hydroponic supply store and I walk down the fertilizer aisle, in my opinion as a traditional horticulturist, there are way too many fertilizer products, and while I acknowledge and am trying to learn quickly the nuances with the cannabis plant, because I've spent my research career on poinsettias and geraniums and petunias, I want to learn how it's unique, but I still don't think we need all of those products. So what, um, Peter, to follow up with that, if you were to go down that aisle and uh, only keep the, 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 the type of products that you think are necessary, what would you keep? I'm going to sidestep that slightly, Shango, and, and bring in how Colin and I, with our research training and background, uh, I'm an Ohio State Buckeye for graduate school. You were? Texas Tech graduate school. All right. Um, I don't mean to exclude you. You were Northeastern and Harvard, correct? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I, I think what I see is not necessarily I'm going to pick out which products should be there, Shango, but I think in this industry we need more um, science and research validating the products that are on the shelves. Amen. So mm -hmm. I'm used to my side of horticulture going through that. So when I'm in the trade show downstairs, and tomorrow in my presentation I'll reference some of this, when I see a booth that feels the need to say science-based or science-backed, 
in its message, I'm wondering why, why does this industry need to do that? It must mean that so many others are not science-based. Right on, I like that. And that was a good sidestep too. So question two. So um, the next question is about developing best practices. So I'll start with Peter, who was just speaking uh, this time. So Peter's giving a presentation tomorrow all about how to design your own internal company experiments so that you can develop next level SOPs and maybe happen to discover some intellectual property along the way. So it's going to be very interesting, and that's tomorrow. Um, but we're going to start with the, you, um, Peter. So since we are all growing cannabis as a commodity, small differentiators between companies uh, make all the difference, whether they be in marketing, product quality, or distribution expertise. Cannabis companies with an awareness of analytics and spreadsheets are setting up in-house cultivation experiments to create some citizen science right there on the front lines of cannabis growing instead of in a lab. So Peter, what is the mindset that you recommend to commercial cannabis cultivators who want to embark on setting up experiments under their own roof, and where should they start? Okay, that's, that's, that's a great question. I want to start out by trying to dispel another myth, perhaps. Um, you hear the word research and it can sound intimidating or dry or difficult. And I, I think the opposite. As, as a 65 year old, I'm still as excited today as I was at 18 to see a seed germinate or a cutting root. So for you folks, as cultivators, my word is grower on my side of the industry. I think um, we hear the phrase citizen scientist these days in our daily lexicon. I'd like to say cultivator scientist, grower scientist, and um, the, the excitement about running a trial or an experiment in your own operation that if designed correctly will result or yield some really good information that you use to make decisions um, that, that's what I get charged up about, and I'd like to convey to you folks through the course of the conference. Right on. So, Colin, your approach is slightly different because you're coming out of the lab. What are your thoughts? I think that there's a real challenge with understanding how to conduct research, and I think it's kind of um, more complicated, uh, thought of as more complicated than it is. And the truth is, the more simple a uh, researcher and experiment is, the more resolution there is. And what we find as a team, and you know, Peter kind of changed my life. We met a lot earlier this year, and we've engaged ever since. And he's coming from a horticulturalist point of view, and I'm coming from a research scientist point of view from Colorado State University. We did a lot of uh, pretty sophisticated research for years and years. Ecosystem level, lots of interactions, those types of things. So I understand. Uh, setting up experimentation, and I kind of take it for granted. And as a microbiologist creating technologies, biology that I want to use in agriculture, and I want it to be successful, we have to collect the data. And I asked Peter on the phone point blank, and this was like early February, why do so many experiments fail? Why isn't biology more actively adopted in agriculture? And I'll never forget what he said, and I wanted a real and biased answer from a horticulturalist, and he said, Colin, you might not like this answer. I know I don't like this answer, but the truth is cultivators don't necessarily, I'm talking generally, understand how to conduct experiments. And over 50% of the trials that you engage in, and that was from his experience coming to me, are going to be skewed because of experimental error on the grower side in the grow facility. And I've been testing that hypothesis ever since engaging with facilities avidly across the country. And it takes one misfeed or one AC outage or one infestation to completely disseminate an experimental, uh, experimental design, an experimental trial. And again and again and again it happens. And if someone comes to me and says, you know, I think I see a result, but I'm not so sure, then you dissect what happened across that experiment, that growth trial. Either something did happen, or there was an infestation, or the power went out. There's always something that seems like interfered with the controlled side by side. So I would say 
that the challenge is a little bit of knowledge and having a dedicated area, facility that's very controlled, that you can dedicate, again, to a controlled side-by-side -side where you don't change anything else. If you want the resolution on what to add into your grow, don't change anything. It has to be in the same room, the same climate, the same strain, and you just manipulate one factor and then you measure differences. And if you see a difference by changing one factor and you can repeat that because science is repeatable, then you might have something that will bring value to you. But having the commitment and the time and the dedication to conduct that trial is very challenging for a lot of commercially producing facilities. Right on, good point. So there's a lot of uh, home and patient growers in the room too. So Jeff, you know, you've been helping gardeners better their skills for decades through your 40 plus year gardening column. Um, how might uh, this, these ideas apply to a home grower? Well, you know, of course, home growers, particularly home cannabis growers, are the worst scientist experimenters in the world because, you know, we get this idea that, uh, oh, you know, this this project, this is supposed to work. Well, if I, I'm only allowed to grow eight plants, if I put it on one plant and it works, I've wasted seven plants. You know, I'll put it on all the plants. You know, and so, so we don't experiment properly. We don't have enough discipline to do it the right way. And, and so what I've tried to do in terms of my books is, is write books that, that give you enough science so that you can figure out what's going on and whether it makes sense. Just as we have to learn which social media platforms we can rely on and you know which, which news organizations are real and which aren't real, all this Russian crap, you know. Just as we gotta learn that stuff, we have, to, we have to do the same thing with regard to where we get our science from. We get a lot of science. Because it's so easy now for, for people to do you know geometric stuff and uh, do DNA testing and all these things we never thought possible. You can do right in your own home, you know, for maybe a thousand bucks. You can do DNA stuff, and people are doing it, you know. But that doesn't mean they're doing it the right way. So we have to just be on our toes all the time. I think we have to put pressure on companies when they are selling us a product to be able to tell us enough about the product on the websites, which they all have. That, that gives us confidence in the product. So we can go to Collins site and go to Mammoth and we can look up what they have and what they're doing and who they are and all that kind of stuff and as opposed to, you know, the, the product you buy that's, you know, got something on the label that you don't really know about and okay, you know, it's a nice picture, you know. Sort of the miracle grow, uh, you know, versus being sensible and doing your homework. Nice. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to ask a bonus question uh, before we move on to the third question. So um, what would each of you think would be an area that a commercial cultivator or, or even a home grower might want to look into uh, doing a little of their own research? What do you think is an area that's ripe for fresh research? Terpenes and flavonoids. I mean, I, you know, we, we, we still are stuck in the sativa, indica, base when you go in and purchase and sell and that's stupid because we know indica and sativa first of all may not even exist properly anymore and second of all we know that that's not the the, the parameters that we should be using to determine what we're buying and so i would i would say anything you can do to learn about flavonoids and can cannabinoids uh is is going to be a big plus peter i think my response is as a grower having grown up on a vegetable farm and run a commercial greenhouse. For me, it's learning how to... I got the phone, but I just didn't get the watch. Thank <laughs> God there isn't a chip, because I don't have enough hands, you know what I mean? But, so for, for me, it's, it's experimenting, learning how to allow that plant to grow better whether it's yield, whether it's size, whatever it is. How do we manipulate um, how the plant grows and respect that the plant's going to grow with or without us, but we're merely there to serve it and re help it reach its potential. I'm gonna redirect you a little bit, Colin, because I know, because we're buddies, that you, you probably toured more professional cannabis cultivation operations than anybody around. Uh, even globally and so you've seen the insides a lot of things so I would think that you would have a different kind of insight about what kind of research could be taken up in those facilities that would immediately benefit them 
You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of pivot from that. Sure. There's research and there's a lot of things we can do, and we're very interested in quality and terpenes and cannabinoids and the different strains that can do these. So there's a lot of room for genetics, and I'm excited about a, a lot of this stuff. I'm excited about inputs and, and maximizing and really dialing for strain how to optimize growth and yield. I mean, I talk about it all the time, but honestly, you know, I'm, I'm becoming increasingly aware of and, and kind of focus on getting a better understanding of what we don't know. And I've been aware of like in the grow now, it's just like ecology and like ecosystem ecology is what I'm looking at in a grow room. There's so many different interactive properties that influence plant growth. You know, there's not only genetics, there's lighting and there's temperature and there's humidity and there's airflow and there's all these below ground factors like even that not only the quality of the water but the temperature of the water and then nutrients you have going in there and the oxygen flux in the soil and then there's a microbial component and then there's contamination, all this stuff. And I don't think that it's thought of as a holistic approach more than not. And I think when people walk into a grass, oh, this fascinating technology just this week while I was here, we could actually analyze hot spots of contamination in a room and you can look in a room and see where there might be potential sources of danger as far as infection, as far as uh, pests coming in. Sure. And you could have the cleanest room in the world except for on the mop handle. <laughs> except for on the fire hydrant or the, 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 the fire extinguisher. Except on the cat. And you can be in completely buttoned up suits. And so there's things that you don't know, you don't know. You never think that the mop that you're using to clean your facility is a source of contamination. And when I saw that, I was like, wow, you know, how do we get to the level where we understand how to control for, um, for those unknown, to those things that just aren't in our purview? And measuring at that level is where I think the most important progress of any grow you know you have to have the right genetics and it starts and stops with plant genetics but you can ruin any plant genetics as soon as there's an infestation or as soon as there's a temperature drop or as soon as there's a temperature increase so I'm fascinated by it I just think it's it's a really interesting environment uh, that's very hard to control and so that's what I would say just this overall awareness of every room is an ecosystem and it's dynamic and figuring out how to how to dial in or mitigate risk uh, over time would probably bring growers more value than any other research project. Wow, well put. So, uh, I wasn't sure if you leaned forward because you're going to jump in on that, Peter, or you're just right. So, uh, so Jeff, we're going to start with you on uh, on this question. So, um, so during the panel today, we've encouraged people in different ways to educate and change habits. Right, look into what your processes are, and and make sure that that those are the processes you want. So as we look into the future, say five years from now, which is a long time in cannabis years, um, what is one thing that you see significantly changing in cannabis horticulture, and how might commercial cannabis cultivators plan for it now as it comes down the line? Well, you, you know what I'm going to say. I know. Go for it. Auto flower. <laughs> I think auto flowers are the next tomato, um, both for the home gardener, because I think they're easy to grow. They're small, they don't have a photo period problem. You can go from seed to harvest in seven to nine weeks. You have a tomato plant that my mother would grow, uh, particularly once it's legal. Um, she might even, she might have even thought about it when it was illegal. But um, commercial growers, on the other hand, really put their nose up in the air about these things. But lately, uh, they, are, they are equally as good in my book as a commercial plant. Um, when you take into consideration the speed they grow, auto flowers are the next tomato. We're going to be seeing them everywhere. We're going to be seeing them at Lowe's and Home Depot, uh -huh. and you know we're going to be seeing them at Christmas time, decorated like little Christmas trees. <laughs> and this is it. This is it. The genetics have changed so drastically in the past year or two that they are every bit as good as commercial large, big, gigantic plants that take a long, long time to grow and that have a photo period necessity. So that's where I'm. 
And if you and if you're if you're new to auto flowers and you're not really familiar with it, um, oddly enough, Jeff and I are both giving talks tomorrow on autos. And go to very, his. Go to his. That's what <laughs> well, they're very different. Uh, yeah. Jeff's got a new book coming out in October, uh, which is auto flowers, like for for beginners and, and for maybe your neighbor who you want to kind of get into cannabis. So his uh, at the beginning of the day is going to be an introduction to growing auto flowers, kind of a general introduction to cultivation. Period. And then my talk in the afternoon at two. 30 is going to be more about um, uh, patient-oriented medical grow applications and commercial applications uh, in a in a bigger scale. So, Perfect fit. Yeah, so that'd be great. So, so, uh, so Jeff. Okay, so that was auto flowers. And so, uh, how about you, Peter? So, um, uh, reminding you since I kind of took it back off course. What's one thing that you see significantly changing in cannabis horticulture in the next five years, and how might commercial cannabis cultivators plan for it? Can I? First, respond to Absolutely. add to something that, that Jeff said. Um, again, from the commercial ornamental world, we've been trying to do this with poinsettia, which is a short day plant, and chrysanthemum for generations. Mm -hmm. So, with breakthroughs here that might then spread and be applied to other crops, poinsettia is this country's number one flowering potted plant. And, so uh, far. So far. Yeah, well said. Uh, well, that we know of. It's been reported. Yeah. How about a poinsettia ruderalis cross, Peter? Oh, <laughs> As a home beer brewer and a lover of growing hops in my backyard and the relationship between the crops, uh, there's just so much excitement going on and bouncing around my head. Shango, to answer your question, um, an interesting dynamic that, that I see is that the commercial greenhouse grower is now looking to grow indoors with vertical farming without the sun. Your industry traditionally has grown indoors without the sun and you folks are looking to grow in the greenhouse. I see an opportunity. One of my messages tomorrow is a plant is a plant is a plant. And I see a wonderful opportunity, two industries that are passionate about the plants they grow coming together, working together as horticulturists and my message to my growers around the country that are, that are growing poinsettias and geraniums and having trouble battling the mass market and low pricing, my, my message to them is cannabis, why not us? We, we know how to grow crops in a greenhouse. We just need to retool and learn how to grow this new species. And my message to you folks is welcome aboard. There's plenty of room and greenhouse space for everybody. So, so to dig into that a little bit, Peter, so are you saying that the big change coming to cannabis cultivation in five years is that we're, all, we're going to be moving even more so into greenhouses? Is that the, the point you're making? To a degree, Shango, I, I am not one that believes that it's going to end up one size fits all. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going to have a, a blend regionally between outdoor, greenhouse, and indoor. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say that LED lighting is going to take over the entire industry because uh, I'm, I'm on an advisory board for a medical group up in Maine, and they have been growing indoors and are now looking to expand and put up a greenhouse to complement, mm -hmm. supplement. Right on. And there's nothing quite like those sunshine-fed terpene profiles, that's for sure. Uh, so, uh, so Colin, uh, same thing with you, brother. So, uh, in the in about in the next five years, what do you see as being a significantly changing thing in cannabis horticulture, and how can commercial growers pay, prepare for it? I think I, I agree. I was just having a conversation with someone else yesterday. Todd McCormick is a really interesting dude. Uh, he's been in the industry for a long time, and he's working with a lot of people. And I hear this repeatedly, at least in North America, in the U.S. It's scaling. You know, commercial facilities are scaling, and it's so incredibly expensive to maintain an indoor warehouse style facility uh, through the energy use alone and the mitigation of pests and everything that's going on that you have to manage and the labor and everything. That uh, I have seen several tomato facilities, large scale commercial tomato, high value tomato facilities that are growing tomatoes for nothing swapping over to cannabis and at some point there's a threshold where these large-scale very sophisticated producing 
companies are going to flip to cannabis and change the game. And I don't think that cannabis is going to drop. And I'm no, I don't think cannabis is going to be the cost of a tomato. But I think it's going to drop significantly. And I just, you know, I don't have a crystal ball that works. But I have a sense from enough data points coming in and people in the industry that you have to be ready to produce at significantly less than you can produce now. And I, I kind of take that the people that haven't been able to produce in some of the markets that have had a shift or a significant shift in costs are not in business anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that scale is key. And I think greenhouse growing is one way that you can scale um, and, and stay competitive in, can in the cannabis industry if you're a producer. I think I would add to that too that no, there's no question that the scaling is, is coming, especially as uh, the big ag companies are, are coming to the table. And I also think that you know most of us who love the plant, we think like artisan producers. And while we definitely need to uh, get a lot of the, the tricks of the trade from folks that we can, from scaling to use in our artisan grows, I also think that we, as as both business owners, but also as a cannabis scene, need to like search our hearts and figure out how much we want to support scaling, because a lot of these companies are going to be producing, uh, you know, huge fields of flavorless flowers that are going to be the Budweiser of of cannabis, and then there's going to be people who are doing craft at smaller levels, but their skills have got to turn to specialty marketing. And, and so that their products stay up set, are set apart. So, so I agree with you on the scaling, but I also think that we each need to decide for ourselves how far we want to go down that path. Can, can and I, we all need to grow some tomatoes just so that we know how to do it. When they're growing cannabis, we'll, we'll have <laughs> tomato <laughs> cannabis. <laughs> yeah, can, I, can I add to that? I think that's really interesting. We're, yeah. we're in Fort Collins, Colorado, and there's a lot of breweries in Fort Collins, Colorado. New Belgium Brewery is one of those, and we kind of modeled our company, Man With Microbes, over some of the culture and values uh, that New Belgium did, and they're really known to be company-owned and, and these really wonderful properties internally, and that's how we modeled our company. So, you know, we're, we're, a, we're a company. Our, our, our employees own the company. Everyone has shares, and I think that's a really cool thing to do. From a research scientist going to a business guy, I don't really care about business structure. I just want to do things cool, and, and, and that's some of the things that we did. And New Belgium Brewery is right around the corner from our facility. I was having a conversation with uh, – one of the folks kind of higher up in that in that uh, organization and they're really struggling right now and it was a really well-known craft brew fat tire and they have a lot of different brands and they do a, a wonderful job branding and they have great products and what happened is they were dominant they were the largest microbrew operation in the world and they still are and they're suffering the reason they're suffering is because at one point they're competing against Budweiser and Coors and, and all those major breweries and they distinguished themselves because they weren't that. Just like the craft versus just the, the producers that are growing flavorless flour. And I agree with that and I think there's always gonna be a demand for craft. But what happened to New Belgium Brewery is Budweiser acknowledged that and they started buying up craft breweries. And now, although New Belgium thought they would have a brand loyalty, after a couple of years, people got amnesia and they're buying these craft breweries that are actually owned by Budweiser. And so there's this strategic shift from the large breweries to also be a craft brewery. And I think it's interesting. And once I heard that, I was like, huh, you know, there's a potential for that to happen. And I'm pretty keen on having small craft breweries and, and small family or mid, mid family owned businesses uh, be a huge part of the cannabis industry and we have a, a small company ourselves, and so I'm keen on that but I think it's important to look at the dynamics of other industries to see where that trend might be so if you know where the puck's going you can kind of position yourself to protect yourself from that. Yeah right on. And I think we make a mistake looking just at the alcohol industry as you know it's so comparable because they both get you high. My father was in the butter business, and then margarine came along because some guy wrote a wrote an article that said uh, you know butter fat's bad. It tur turned out to be false, false news and all that kind of stuff. He's rolling over in his grave today now that we know that it was all bunk. But 
But he was in the butter business, so he came out with a little margarine, you know, and he had his margarine going along, but his was a craft butter, and, and uh, he stuck with it, and then he started private labeling, you know, and things. So there are ways you can you can keep alive and do it, and I think that's a much better analogy. I mean, as, as, as local people, you're gonna need to start co-oping together, somebody's gonna have to be the packer, somebody's gonna be the grower, someone's gonna be this, you know, you need, we need to start being crafty about being craft businesses and I don't I don't think we're we're thinking together quite yet but it'll happen as soon as you know Budweiser gets into the business and it's not not going to be very long so did you want to weigh in on that Peter I did we have a question over here are we doing questions now or again? Um, we may or may not have time for questions so so uh, but Peter if you if you were not not gonna uh, continue on I was actually gonna shift to questions now so did you want to weigh in on that and yeah yeah so could. go ahead and then we'll move to questions okay so this this thread that you're pulling yeah about size of operation and Colin's reality check on scaling is very dear to me uh, I've tried to spend my career as a researcher conducting research to help my fellow growers who are small and medium in size I think part of the um, a story that Colin's sharing with New Belgium is, and I've experienced it on the commercial greenhouse side, when you end up too big to be small and too small to be big and get caught in that middle area, there's, there's an issue. Now, I, I'm, I'm very passionate over my lifetime as a commercial greenhouse operator. Um, I've often asked the question, why is it in this country that the only measure of success is how big you are. And if I could change that and, and create an environment where you can be small and successful, that's, that's my passion, that's the torch I try to carry. And we walk the path in commercial greenhouses with ornamental crops and bedding plants and whatnot where um, big greenhouse operations fuel the mass market and my family's operation as a small family garden center, uh, we survived from the 1960 to 2010. And as the recession took hold, um, we were always able to charge more than the mass market, but during the recession, we couldn't charge enough to stay in business. And we closed our doors. I'm very passionate about your industry being able to hold on to um, some success in being small. Now, just to finish up the comment, two weeks ago I heard that two of our top 100 greenhouse operations, top 100 in the country in size, acreage, are closing their doors and selling out for hemp, hemp production. I turned to my wife and I said, great, those big greenhouses put me out of business as a small <laughs> family-run garden center. Good, they get what they, did full circle, now they're going out of business and selling out to a new crop. Which is going to be a problem for the little guy because the hemp stuff, you know, the pollen gets into your crops and that's not good. So uh, it's, all, it's all a big, terrible circle. Uh, right on. So we've got time for a couple questions. Why don't you go ahead first? Um, so a couple of months ago, there was a study published by a group out of Berkeley that uh, they genetically modified a host of yeast cells to produce cannabinoids such as THC and CBD. <clears throat> so piggybacking off of Colin's statement about scale, do you really think these Budweiser's and you know Marlboro's of the cannabis future are going to be growing plants? Or are just, they just going to be brewing giant vats of this stuff? I have an opinion on that. I saw that, that study and I wasn't sure. Uh, just to be fair, I'm not sure exactly the state of that technology, but it's coming. Mm -hmm. And I think that they still have a little ways, but I think there's going to be a place for that. If you think about the farm industry, the farm industry is not going to want to manage greenhouses and grow plants. They're going to want to make stuff in fermenters. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I think. Do I think as uh, a, a consumer of cannabis is going to want to take it, <laughs> consume from a cannabinoid that's extracted from a yeast? I don't know. I, I'll just say I don't know. I mean, well, it I, would, I, would, I would assume no, but I'll tell you what, if it's made into a pill. That's right. And I don't know what that statistic is on, on, on pill consumption in the United States, but it's extremely high. And so there's going to be a market for that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be the market that we acknowledge as a cannabis industry today. 
I think it's a medical market there. I mean, if you have Crohn's, some, some terrible intestinal disease, and you can take a yeast-based pill that'll release THC in your intestines in an anaerobic environment, wow, pretty cool. Uh, you know, that, that might make a tremendous amount of sense. Yeah. Do you want to smoke the stuff? I don't know. I mean, you know, some people put yeast on popcorn. Ugh. 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 Yeah. I love yeast on popcorn. See, yeast is on, you know, or her own. So I have this idea, having been in um, horticulture not related to cannabis, I see a lot of industry groups that market together, that work together, that produce uh, research together. And I don't see a whole lot of that happening in the cannabis. Is that, what do you think about that as being sort of a model for how the cannabis industry could move forward with research, protecting its brands, its artisan qualities, all that kind of stuff? You're beginning to see it, I think, you know, in, in places like uh, the Emerald Triangle, here in, in Port, you know, we have clean, green certified, uh, there are marketing co-ops in lots of different places. The problem is it's been illegal. And right. still, you know, and there's no banking. And, right. and everybody's worried that if they make the wrong move marketing-wise, you know, the government comes down and says, ooh, you know, it's God, it's a good thing Jeff Sessions not around, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's, it'll happen. And there are some that are there already. So. I think I can speak for Colin and myself, both, both being tied to the academic community. Right. We've got colleagues around the country salivating for the federal law to change so that all of these university program, land grant universities, mm -hmm. uh, can get involved. We have friends all around the country salivating as well. So <laughs> and when they're not in academics. But. It's hard enough because at the moment you're not even supposed to be sending samples back and forth, right? So it's hard to, to even develop labs and such when, you, when, when, you're, when you're not supposed to be shipping your samples. So. Well, and if you're only allowed to grow six plants, for example, I mean, that's not an experiment, period. Well, unfortunately, we have reached the end of our time, and so we need to make room. So uh, thank you very much. Put your hands together for Peter Kung, Joyan, Jeff Lowenfeld, and Colin Bell. And Shango, and Shango.